you're in for a treat today. Could you get two bishops for the price of one? For the second week. Huh? I said for the second week. For the second, two weeks in a row. How many of you were here last Sunday? How many of you enjoyed or got something out of last weekend? Okay, good. Well, we're hoping you're going to get something out of today. Last week we talked about, what did we talk about? Dating. Dating. Recognizing potential mates. RPMs. <laughs> Recognizing potential mates. RPMs. Good. Today, we're going to talk about love and marriage. And what's the first thing you think of when you hear the words love and marriage together? You think of love and marriage, love and marriage, go together like a horse and cabbage. Yeah, here we go. Every service exactly the same. <laughs> Nobody remembers the This is why you guys are not on the worship team. <laughs> Timing was off, couldn't remember the lyrics. Actually, that's like some Sundays. We all get like that. Everybody has moments like that. But man, we're going to talk about love and marriage today. And so we're going to talk to, let's talk to the singles really quick. Because we don't want you to tune us out. Singles, young adults. In fact, I had one single young adult come up to me after and said, this was just as good as last week. Pulled out so many principles out of this week of what to look for in a, in a potential mate as well. So we're hoping that you know, God's going to speak to you through his word today, because that's what we're going to use. Yes. And we're going to talk to you pretty openly and candidly. Yes. And we're going to give you the seven uh, keys to building a happy, healthy marriage. Yeah. Why seven? I don't know. That's where we stop. The number at seven. of perfection. It is the that. number of perfection. <laughs> and you are on number seven. Oh, thank you, honey. Wow. See, everybody ready. thinks he's, that 10 is a good thing, but 7 with... is the number of completion. <laughs> it's perfect. You are perfect. No. Oh, thank you, babe. I'm far from perfect, but thank you. Thank you. We'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> um, but even if, you know, even if you've been married before. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you realize um, the mistakes that you've made and you are praying and hoping that God um, will bring somebody um, new in your life and you're praying to be married again, this is definitely yeah. something that you want to listen to because, um, you know, there's a lot of wisdom in God's word. And um, I would just recommend for those of you um, that are married, that are wanting to become married, that are wanting to become um, the right person for Mr. or Mrs. Wright, start reading Proverbs. Yeah. You know, Proverbs has 31 chapters. Read a chapter a day. There is so much yeah. wisdom in this book, so much wisdom on how to be a good wife, so much wisdom on how to be a good person. Um, and um, I think it'll really benefit you. Yeah, so singles, don't tune us out. Single again, those who've walked through divorce. God is a God of restoration. Come on now. Yeah. And God's able to, you know, just because the thing didn't work out the first time doesn't mean it's not going to work out this time. But let me just say this. If you bring the same garbage into a new relationship, you'll have the same relationship you walked out of. Yeah. yeah. So you've got you to make sure you learn some lessons as you walk through life's journey. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if you're married today, uh, marriage can always get better. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. the reality is, I mean, marriage should be like fine wine. It gets better with age. So how many want some fine wine? Come on, you're looking at some fine wine in your relationship, your spouse today. So it's good. But let's start with the scripture. Yes. Uh, so I want to look at Ephesians chapter 5, which has two verses in it that everybody knows mm -hmm. and one that nobody really remembers. The one for men that everyone knows is Ephesians 5.22. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Baby, you got to submit to me. Come on, how many have ever heard that verse and it was kind of, oh my gosh, submission, like, woo, not good. Um, that's because our culture doesn't understand the word submission from a biblical perspective. I think a lot of times we think submission is a negative thing. In fact, the Bible teaches it's a Christ-honoring thing. Mm -hmm. That submission is a priority. But when you look at this verse, first thing you got to understand is who they're told to submit to, their own husband. Mm -hmm. A lot of people start submitting to another husband. Guess what? They defraud their own husband by listening to somebody else. Yeah. They give another man their ear. Next thing you know, they have their heart. Mm -hmm. That's why I've got to make sure you stay in that thing. So the word submit in the original Greek is from uh, the Greek word. It transliterated hupatasso. It means to place under God's arrangement. Mm. 
Submission is arranging your life the way God designed it. It's called divine order. Yes. There's a divine order to the family. Mm -hmm. There's husband, wife, children. Husband, the Bible teaches, is placed over the wife. They're placed over the wife primarily for protection. Amen. Well, how many of you ladies want to be married to a man when you know, somebody walks up, they're trying to rob you? Hey, go ahead, take it. <laughs> take her too. You don't want, that's not who you want it. You, know, you want to be on someone that's going to protect you. Come on, ladies. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. um, you want somebody that's going to be there. Not that, I see some, I see some ladies tatted up, man. You can handle your own. I know it. But it's nice to have a guy that's there. I got you, girl. <laughs> so you want to have somebody that's protect. You want somebody that's going to provide for you. Mm -hmm. I know some of you are still working on that, aren't you? Right? You provide for you. You want someone that's going to help procure a future for you. They're going to be the person that helps make sure your destiny is going in the right direction. That's submission. Submission is not negative. Submission is holy. But our culture doesn't like that yeah. today. So, yeah. so that's the ladies. For wives, this means submit to your own husband. Here's the one every, every lady likes, Ephesians 5.25. For husbands, this means to love your wives as Christ loved the church and he gave up his life for her. Notice, men, how much the women like that verse. <laughs> give up your life. The word give up comes from the Greek word hand, to mean hand over. I'm handing over my check, I mean my life to you. <laughs> I'm just turning. I'm just giving it to you. I'm handing over me, 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 I, 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 I. And I'm saying it's now we, 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 us, 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 mm -hmm. us, us. Now, for men, that's hard to do. Come on, men. Um, ah, um, ga, ba, 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 ba. I see the hand in the back. Right? It's like, yes, that's me. Um, ga, um, ga, ba, ba. But the reality is it's hard for men to do. Yeah. It's really hard for men to say, listen, I'm handing this over to you. I'm giving up myself. Christ gave up his life for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. That's the picture. I think the ladies in this passage seem to have gotten it a little easier. Mm -hmm. Ladies, submit. Men give up everything, their life. But now all that means nothing unless you understand the context of the passage. Yeah. So each one of these, when you read it independently, can seem a little sexist, right? But context is king in the Bible. You've got to know the whole story. You can't just pick one verse out and say, oh, here it is. Baby, submit. <laughs> can't do that. Be great, but we can't. Or, honey, Stop. Give me your checkbook. Give me your credit card. I know you got the gold card, platinum card hidden somewhere. Give it to me. That's not what it means. So here, the, there's, a, there's a word that starts each one of these verses. It's the word for. For wives, for husbands. For is a coordinating conjunction. A conjunction is a word that joins a thought to a previous thought. Here's the previous thought. It's Ephesians 5.21. The verse before, for wives. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This whole story and discussion of husbands, wives, children, and it goes into other different categories, is all about mutual submission. Oh, I know this ain't popular today to talk about. But it's all of us submitting to each other. Let's be honest. Let me ask you a question. How many of you truly like to submit? Raise your hand. Exactly. Exactly. Because that's human nature to not submit. But the Bible teaches human nature is at war with spiritual nature. Spiritual nature says we should submit. But our flesh says, I don't want to submit. And that's why God says submit. Because it breaks the flesh in our lives. Love and submit. Love and submit. Go together like the Bible and church. <laughs> you know, and when you look at this verse and you look all throughout um, the Bible, especially in Revelation, mm -hmm. um, when you look at the relationship between a husband and wife, it's often compared to Christ yeah. coming back for his bride. And his bride is who? Church. The church. And so our marriages are a reflection of that. And that's why it's so important to have 
healthy marriages in the church, not only for our children yep. um, and for generations to come, but from when people who um, have no belief in God, when they see our marriages and they see that there's something different about yeah. our marriages, they know that God must be that third person in our marriage, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah, and so that's why it's so important um, that when unbelievers see us, they see a healthy, strong marriage. You know, there has been um, statistics given around that there's 50% divorce rate, right? in the world, and that it's no different in the church. Well, recently, um, a psychologist actually has been doing a 10-year study and found that actually within the church, the divorce rate is actually half of that of the world. Come on now. So there is Come something on. different about our marriages. Right. When you have Christ in your marriage, the Holy Spirit, when, something, when you're doing something wrong, the Holy Spirit kind of creeps up and says, mm, yep. apologize. Mm, you shouldn't have said that. So... Does God make a difference in your marriage? Absolutely. Absolutely. So make sure that you're taking notes today. Yeah. Hey, I think we have our, our, our wedding picture up here, one of them. Should we put that up there? Okay. We'll get it up there. Come we got on. married in September 11th. No, not no, September, September 11th. 3rd. Excuse me, September 3rd, 2001. 2001, 2001 yeah. So it was oh, yeah. right before September 11th. So we were actually on our honeymoon when September 11th happened. We were in happened. Hawaii on our honeymoon. And we got there. stuck oh there God. an extra week. got stuck week. there for five, day, five days, right? Yeah. Was five days. Said, yeah. Everybody says, oh, terrible to be stuck in Hawaii. It was. It's very expensive there. And the hotel didn't give it, you know, we were staying at one of those all-inclusive, so each night was not an all-inclusive night. I'm just saying. It was <laughs> a little expensive, but we were foolish. We didn't, you know, you don't think negative things are going to happen. So about three days into our trip, we said, hey, why don't we just rent a Mustang convertible and just tour all of Waikiki? Yeah, we blew some money on that thing. It was part of our budget. We maxed out our budget, so then when we had to stay longer, it was like cha-ching, 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 because we weren't prepared for it. But then we came back. It was scary getting on a plane right after that. Anybody remember that? Your first flight mm -hmm. after? Ooh, I literally said, honey, give me a pen. Give me something sharp. <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> true. That's a true story. I was yeah, like, that. I was like, oh, my gosh. Anyway, so that's our picture. Look at it. Man, Mary looks just as good. In fact, I'll tell you what. I have hair. Look. There's the evidence. <laughs> it was jet black and full. Here, that was, that was a thing. That was September 3rd, 2001. 18 years. Yes, 18 years. Going on 19 this year, and she still puts up with me. Mm -hmm. So awesome. So, so let's, we're going to give you seven keys to a happy, healthy marriage. How many marriages want to know some keys today? I don't think they're ready. I don't think you're ready for this. All right, so we're going to have fun today. So here we go. First key to a happy, happy, healthy marriage is start humble, stay humble. Mm. So, man, yeah, pride. There's a lot of statistics out there about marriage, and many of them come out with three leading causes of divorce in America. Uh, number one is miscommunication. Number two is marital unfaithfulness. And number three is financial mismanagement. Those are the three. Eh. Number one cause of divorce, I believe, is pride. I can run my money better than you can. It's not our money as my money. We're totally against couples having separate accounts. Yeah. Because what you're saying is we're not really one flesh. And you don't trust the other person. I don't trust you with my money. That's called pride. Okay. Talking to the right crowd. <laughs> Silence usually reveals to us that it's hitting you. <sighs> Pride. We all have it. We wrestle with it. The Bible says if we don't humble ourselves, he'll humble us. So you got a choice to self-humble or let God humble you. I would choose to self-humble. Just mm -hmm. my perspective. Because he'll, boom. Yep. He'll take you down quicker than you can imagine. Humility. It's hard, right? Yeah. Because mar marriage is about submission. Yes. You can't submit if you're prideful. And marriage is all about serving each other. Oh, yeah. Putting the other person's yep. dreams, hopes above yours. Yep. And so don't get married if you are a selfish person. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. If you don't know how to serve others and put others above yourself, don't get married. Just don't do it. 
Yeah, if you're not, if you if you're interested in someone that man, that person's good, but they're not serving at church, dump them. Dump the chump. Dump the chump. <laughs> dump the chump. Because the reality is, if they're not serving in their local church, which is the bride of Christ, they ain't gonna serve you either. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, great. <laughs> so when you go through life prideful and you're saying, it's my way. That's my car. That's my money. That's not humility. I'm grateful God has blessed me with a wonderful woman who helps humble me. Now, that's a good thing. God gives us each other to help refine each other, that to help shape each other. Iron. You know, iron sharpens iron. And I think so often, come on, man, let's be honest. Don't you, come on, do you push back when your wife tries to sharpen you? Thank you, Pastor Matt. I appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, I'm a, sometimes it's hard to handle as a man. Like, I'm a man. It's mach machismo, you know. Macho, macho man. I want to be your macho man. <laughs> right? It, it's something in us. It's the machismo. It's the macho in us that resists that. But really, macho is pride. It's us not being able to receive criticism or correction from the person who loves us most in this life. If I can't receive it from her, what I'm saying is I don't trust you. Mm -hmm. And it's how you say it. You know, oh, um, that's true. ladies, we tend to nag, Ooh. right? We tend to treat our husbands. We tr tend to treat our husbands like our children. Yeah. Our husbands are not our children. You know, in Proverbs. Even says, though we act like it at times. <laughs> Proverbs. So much wisdom. Read Proverbs. Proverbs 27, verse 15. It says this. A quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or gasping oil with the hand, right? What, what you... I'm the constant dripping in your life. You are, you are. You get what you brag on, not, not what, what you, you nag, nag on. on. You get what you brag on, not what you nag on. So, you know, like how we talked about last week, one of, the sin, one of the consequences of the sin of Eve yeah. was that kind of that inner thing that we want to control our husbands, right? And it says in Genesis, but he will rule over you. And so you always have to keep that in check, you know, especially um, since the, the feminist movement, right, in the 60s. Women have now, you know, elevated in um, different areas of life, career, everything, which is awesome, which yep. should be applauded. Yep. But what comes with that is now we want to take the role of men. We want to wear the pants in our family. Literally. We now. want to dominate things. True. <laughs> and so you need to be really careful that you're not treating your husband like your child. It's okay to applaud. Because, you know, it literally, there, there's been times, we'll be honest, I say, yeah. man, I, I'll say, Mary, listen, I'm not I mean, your kid. Yeah. yeah. Because when you disrespect your husband, that diminishes their security. You know, men crave respect. It's mm -hmm. just a natural byproduct mm -hmm. of who God made us to be. When men feel disrespected, the greatest way you can ever disrespect your spouse is treat them like your child. It's the greatest way. You you keep doing that over time, trust me, I I can't tell you how many people have been in my office. I'm like, man, if you talk to them like this in my office, I can't imagine what you say at home. Truth. Yeah, I think which leads us to number yeah. two. Yeah, number two. Praise your spouse publicly. Like, like man, come on now. It, it's like, that's why every Sunday, like, I'll always try and mention my wife. It's true, right? I always try my Puerto Rican princess, or I'll just mention my beautiful wife, Mary. You know, I'll mention, hey, where to get, oh, number one, I want to do that. Number one, to raise her and elevate her. Number two, I want all the other ladies to know, this guy's taken. <laughs> like, I know, listen, I just know I'm such a strapping young man. That you are, babe, you are. I want to make sure everybody knows. <laughs> but you got to praise each other publicly, mm -hmm. and so... I th we've been around many couples, right? That demean each other. Oh, they demean each yes. other in, in group dates. You're like, oh, dear God. Like, literally, I'm like, I can't believe you're talking about her like that. And they'll run her over and then reverse and back right over her. And I just don't understand. And typically what I find, it's the men doing it. 
Now, I don't always see the women doing it. You might have a perspective on that. But men, bite your tongue. If you ain't got nothing to say, shut your hole. All the ladies, I'm helping you out today. You should be like, thank you, Pastor. I've been telling them that for years. But I think it's true with ladies. There's some ladies that. Yeah, no, I've met. He's um, so lazy. Look at his beard. Or talk to many a lady that um, just demeans their husband, constantly yep. just um, saying negative things about their husband. And, um, you know, there's just a few things about that. When you do that, um, it allows certain things to come into your marriage that do not need to be in your marriage. That's true. People are always listening to what you're, what mm -hmm. you're saying. The opposite sex is always listening to what you're oh, saying. Yeah. It allows um, insecurity to come into your marriage, but also it allows a devil of foothold into yeah. your marriage that now you're open to other people speaking into your marriage who have no right to speak into your marriage. You're allowing the opposite sex sometimes to speak into your marriage that have no right to speak into your marriage, and that could lead into other things. So along with that, be very, very, very careful on who you speak to about your marriage. Never, ever talk to the opposite sex about what is going on in your marriage. Absolutely. Be very careful on who you spend time with alone, um, whether at work, whether um, just hanging out. At the gym. If you are single there, and you have a best friend who's the opposite sex, that has to change the moment you get married. Yeah. That has to change the moment that you get married. There is no way that you can have a best friend of the opposite sex who is Plus not spouse. your spouse. That's too much work. <laughs> just so just be very, very careful. Your spouse should be your best friend. Mm -hmm. Come on, I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. Uh, this half is okay. I don't know what you guys are smoking over here. You're like, but you know, our jobs as spouses is, like my husband said, to elevate the yes. other person, to call out the greatness in them. That's right. And that's why we were saying you get what you brag on, not what you nag on. When you keep on bragging yep. about those strengths of them, they're going to keep on wanting to please you and wanting to do things that make you happy. Yeah. What, another way to say that is what gets rewarded gets repeated. Yes. And if you keep honoring and you keep saying, Hey, thanks for taking out the trash on time. Thanks for picking up the kids on time. Thanks for doing this or whatever that. Hey, thanks for, you know, when you come home, hey, thanks for making dinner. Whatever that looks like in your context, guess what? Hey, wow, they, they appreciated that. But how many times, come on, anybody that does the cooking, whether it's male or female, because I know we, we, all, we all do it yeah, now, sure. do you thank them for cooking the meal that night? Or are you just like, you sit down, you eat, you thank God for the meal, but you don't thank your spouse? Like, God gave you your spouse to help you with the meal. Mm -hmm. So you should thank both. This is good stuff. Are you not? I still don't know what's up with this half. <laughs> All right. Number three, we got to learn to talk. I don't think most people know how to talk. I think they know how to gab. But they don't know how to communicate. They don't know how to clearly articulate how they feel. Come on, does anybody? I have problems with that. I'll be honest. I have a hard time really communicating how I feel, and it usually it builds up, and then I have to eventually I have to have the conversation. Listen, as married, you're going to have awkward conversations. I'm just not going to talk about it. Yeah, and you'll be signing the divorce papers before you know it. You got to learn to talk about things, even things that sometimes you know is going to hurt the other person when you say it, but you know you got to be honest and say, this bothers me that you do this or this hurt me. If more couples would tell their spouse about the hurt that they caused, I think it would protect a lot of marriages. No, absolutely. So, so here's what I've discovered. What you don't talk about, you will squawk about. You'll squawk to somebody else about it. Like Mary was saying before, you'll go to that coworker. And the next thing you know, coworkers listen to you. And, and let me talk to the guys for a second. Guys are like, oh my gosh, what? Your opposite sex coworker will say to you, hey, you okay? I'm okay. No, seriously, are you okay? I, I just hang out with my spouse. Oh, so you want to talk about it? 
That coworker is a seed of the devil at that point mm -hmm. in time. Yeah. Now, they're not the devil. They could be. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times that's been the marital problems in people in our church. It wasn't the person at the bar or the club. It was their coworker because they let their guard down. You got to keep the guard up. Say, hey, we're great. Everything's great. I'm blessed coming in, blessed coming out. In your mind, you can say, my marriage sucks. I don't know what's going on. But you don't let it out unless you're letting it out this way and this way, obviously, right? So you got to learn to talk. you got to communicate. you got to be honest. And I have hurt Mary before. True. All unintentionally, but I know there's been times I drove her to tears. Stupid things I've said, stupid things I've done. But we've had to learn over 18 years to communicate. Yeah, and I think when we first were married, um, it was tough. Yeah, uh, learning how to communicate, because you come from two different backgrounds, two different families, two different ways of communicating. You know, when we were going through premarital counseling, one thing that our counselor said is, what is one thing that you want to bring into your marriage, and what is one thing that you don't want to bring into your marriage? And my husband had um, said this. Why don't you tell everybody what you said that you didn't want to bring into your marriage? Well, you know, growing up uh, in my home, I don't know if any of you can connect with this, but um, we would say whatever the heck we wanted to, however the heck we wanted to, and then apologize later. Does anybody anybody have that upbringing? <laughs> you beep it, and then five minutes later, I'm so sorry. We'd hug. But the words once spoken can never be returned. Mm -hmm. Once it's out there, it's out there. And so, so when it, we got married, it was we, tough. Yes, we both tended not to say anything to each other, clam up, go in I didn't opposite hurt directions. Her. Yeah, because we didn't want to hurt each other. Um, but then we wouldn't talk about it. And then it would kind of build up. Um, and so over the years, we've learned how to take time. It's okay to take time and to process. Yeah, process. To process what you want to say, to process how you feel. Give it like 20, 30 minutes, maybe, you know, beforehand, you could kind of come up with a reasonable time. I always say, don't go to bed angry, though. The Bible says, don't go to bed. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. So try to get it done that day. But do take some time to think about what you want to say, what you're exactly feeling. Make sure that you could try to communicate it. it even if you have to write it down, yeah. how is it that I'm truly feeling so I could communicate it to you effectively? So, you know, think about this. How many of you, when you get sick, you make a doctor's appointment? Okay, the rest of you, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> How many of you, when all of a sudden you bite down on something cold, you, I got, you make a what? A dentist appointment. Okay, this is common sense, guys. <laughs> but now you have a marriage issue, and you don't make an appointment with the person who can help you fix it. So doesn't it make sense... Let's say Mary and I were arguing over my skinny jeans, and she's like, honey, listen, you know, you're 47 now, skinny jeans, you know, and we're having this discussion, right? <laughs> and we're arguing over this, and, and we're saying, I can't talk about it right now. Can we talk about it 6 o'clock tonight? What's wrong with that? It allows you to calm down, take your emotions out of it. It allows me to, to force my way out of my skinny jeans. <laughs> To put on my pajamas <laughs> and to literally, now we can have a conversation where now I'm ready to talk and she's ready to talk. But here's what happens. But I need to talk now. A lot of times women do that, yeah. Anybody, but, any, any of those kind of people? Right okay, now. we got, okay. How many of you need more time? Okay. Notice it's mostly opposite couples. <laughs> it's the opposite in the, it, because if both people need to talk right now, I guarantee it becomes toxic. Because you haven't even processed your feeling. You're just going by what you feel, not what you know. Mm -hmm. That's where most arguments come out of, what I feel about something versus what I know about the person. I know Mary loves me. I know she has my best intentions. I know, and here, newsflash for all the engaged newlyweds, you're going to hurt each other. You're going to hurt each other. It is going to happen. We pray it's always unintentional. Once it becomes intentional hurt, that's another story. But most hurt in a marriage is usually unintentional. And there's nothing wrong with going to counseling. Yes. Why is that such a bad thing? Get there's therapy if you need it. There's nothing wrong. 
you know, something that hurts us so much is when a couple gets divorced yep. and we didn't even know that there was an issue, that they didn't come to us, they didn't ask us for um, advice, or they didn't ask us, hey, do you know a good marriage counselor? They didn't ask us to pray. They didn't ask us to pray. And so it, it kills me when people come up and say, I'm done, that's it. Yeah. And it was like they didn't even try, try to get some sort of counseling. Yeah, and listen, we have a policy here at the church. If you want any of our pastors to marry you, you have to go through pre-marriage counseling. It's not optional. So think about it this way. And, and so most of our pre-marriage counseling happens after hours because most people's work schedules in life. Um, so we charge for that. Why? Because that takes us away from our families. That's worth something. Do you want us to have a healthy marriage, have a healthy family? Then you got to understand, there's a price to that. Now, I, I don't do much of that anymore, but there is a value to it. But people will squawk about $500 for eight sessions, almost two hours each of pre-marriage counseling, but they'll pay four grand for a DJ at a four-hour wedding. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Once again, this half, I don't know what's <laughs> going on. So you got to learn to talk, and, yeah. and, and pre-marriage just helps us. Yes. Absolutely. Learn some school schools, skills in how to communicate mm -hmm. with each other. Uh, that, that leads us into our next thing about embracing conflict. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's encouraging. You're going to have conflict in your marriage. It's going to happen. Conflict will either come from your spouse or it'll come from circumstances. Mm -hmm. You lose your job. Is that conflict? Okay, one, I don't know what's happening over here. <laughs> it's an easy question. If you lose your job, does that create conflict? Yes. Hey, there's people out there. It's great. <laughs> um, you know, you'll always have conflict. We have conflict, but we have also had to learn to fight fair. What do I mean by that? If I've resolved an issue that was previous, I don't bring it back up. Yes. I am bringing it back up. Here's what many couples do. They take, oh, you hurt me. Let me put it in my back pocket to pull it out. Mm -hmm. No way. Then you never truly forgave that person. Yeah. You're just using it as ammunition for a later opportunity. That's devastating to a marriage. I don't know. We try very hard not mm -hmm. to bring up stuff from the past. Occasionally, you know, we blow it. We make mistakes. But mm -hmm. I think we've worked very hard yeah. not to bring up yeah, stuff yeah. We try from really the past. Hard. I mean, I've got so many issues. She's had to help work through it. <laughs> but there's, you know, there's a lot of things that can cause conflict within oh, yeah. a marriage. We talked about finances, right? That's probably one of the money, leading causes of divorce. Um, and we didn't talk about this before, but we always communicate about our finances. Even in the beginning, when we had premarital counseling, he said, you need to come up with a number that you, that you guys could spend. A a, 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 up to. Yeah, up, up to, to a certain amount. So a, a dollar amount that you guys could both spend without asking each other's permission. And in the beginning of our marriage, it was $50. So we could spend $50. We just lost the entire audience on that. I'm sorry. That was 18 years ago. We could spend up to $50 without letting the other person know this is what I'm spending, right? Anything over that, then we needed, we needed to communicate with the other person. And, you know, that has helped us so much in our marriage, even to this day. We still do it. It may not even be $50. Maybe it's like 75 I don't know. I mean, and this is not... This is not talking about our normal bills that Mortgage, we have. With, all yeah, that stuff, not that Food stuff. bill or anything like that, no. Um, this is anything that, you know, above and beyond. If I want to go shopping, I mean, listen, Which I'll tell you. Which is rare. Him, I'm going to go shopping, you know, so he'll expect. I don't spend a lot of money, but he'll expect I'm going to spend, you know, a little bit more than what I used to. He never really goes out and goes and buys a toy for himself that's $3,000 without asking me first. We've had and couples so that have. it's so important that you communicate what you're spending to your spouse. Um, and that will avoid conflict in the future. Another thing that um, sometimes brings in conflict, especially when you're coming, when you're first married, is your family members. Oh, man, let's talk about that. In-laws. Will this or help anybody we say, if we talk about this? OK. In-laws, or should we say outlaws? No. Um, <laughs> But you know, we don't have to deal with this as much because his mom is four hours away. My parents are 14 hours away. Um, even though in the beginning, in the Woo. beginning, this is funny. In the beginning, um, we lived in a little cottage. This is therapy for it us. It was actually. a parsonage from the church that we were we were youth pastors at, and it was small. It was like a one bedroom cottage. And my parents had come. We had death in the family, and so they stayed with us. 
We gave them over our bedroom. Never give up your bedroom for your parents or your children, ever. <laughs> the mistake we made. Um, for the for the week, and my even husband, for the week, my husband, I was starting to see it. He he went into the basement. He started working out, putting on heavy metal music, and I was like, oh, well, okay, I have to have a conversation with my parents. So I had that conversation with my parents. But um, this is the reason why I'm saying this. Um, the Bible says in Ephesians, after that whole thing about husbands and wives, it says this, for this reason, a man shall leave, leave. his father and his mother and Out cling of my house. to his I mean, wife. Um... <laughs> so once you become one, now our priority is each other. each other. My priority is not my parents anymore. His priority is not, not his mom. parents anymore. We're our number one priority. And so we don't have to deal with this that much over the holidays and stuff, but we see countless friends for the holidays, they have to go to their, her, their parent, her parents' house, his parents' house. Then we have to go to this aunt, that aunt, and it ends up becoming so crazy. And then who's offended the because you didn't come to, you know, our family? Who's, you know, and and sometimes when you share what you're going through in your marriage with your parents, your parents are always going to take your side, even though you may not be right in the whole issue. So be very careful when you're sharing information with your family. Actually, they shouldn't be privy to that, honestly. They shouldn't. They shouldn't be privy no. to that information. Um, you could say, pray for us, all that kind of stuff, but you need to be very careful on who you um, yeah, I remember, have uh, speaking to. Funny, I remember. Even, with be- you know, even though your parents do have probably the best intentions for you. I remember um, when Mary and I were engaged, we were watching TV at our at the cottage house we were at. My mother was there visiting. My mother's on the couch, then Mary, then me. And we're sitting there watching a movie. Out of the blue, my mother just looks at us and says, are you keeping it pure and holy? You know what she's talking about, right? You know. And I'm like, I'm like, um, yeah, yeah, of course we are. I mean, we're trying, we're doing the best we can, and and then she goes, well, I know how you Latin, Latin women are. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now, I will say this. Some of the superstars out there aren't giving Latin women a great name. But I will say that my number one priority immediately was to defend my wife, to be. Mm-hmm. And so... So I remember Mary's leaving. Mary's all upset. She's leaving. Now, we're not married yet. Um, But we were engaged. We were engaged. And I literally, when Mary left, I had a conversation with my mother. I said, Mom, don't ever talk about my future wife like that. If you do, you will have no place in my house. Some of you ain't clapping because you don't have the courage to stand up to your parents. But the number one object, I leave my father and mother, and I cleave to my spouse. The biblical principle. Yeah. So here's what I end up. Um, now, here at Fast Forward, now 18 years, my mother says nothing about my wife. But she talks about my brother's wife. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I drew a line in the sand, and I said, not my wife. Uh-uh. Not going to allow it. Anytime. Not gonna let it happen. So you gotta and, you embrace know, conflict. And, and, and it's not that you don't want to honor your parents. You absolutely honor your parents, but you have to remember our main priority is, is each, each other, other and our family. Not even your kids. Husband and wife number one. Kids second. Okay. So, <laughs> so I mean, in, in conflict, embracing conflict leads us into the next thing about forgiveness. Yeah. That's another key to a great marriage. A great marriage isn't the union of two great lovers as much as it is the union of two great forgivers. Yeah. You got to learn to forgive and forgive and forgive. You got to learn to say, I'm sorry, mm. with no but after it. Mm. I'm sorry, but you. No. Why don't you just own it? I'm sorry I hurt you. I'm sorry I said this to you. I'm sorry that I broke your heart. I'm sorry that I broke your trust. Mm-hmm. I think most times we, we're. We can't, those are the three hardest words yes, to say. Yeah. I am sorry. Look at somebody right now, just practice. I, I am, am sorry. sorry. Now, if you're near the person that just hurt you recently, use it. <laughs> I said I'm sorry in church right there. <laughs> so here's what you got to do. You got to understand this. Matthew 6, 15, Jesus speaking. 
He said, if you don't forgive, I can't forgive you. So if I'm unwilling to forgive my bride who hurt me 99% of the time, it's going to be unintentional. God says, I can't forgive you. That's pretty heavy words. That's Jesus speaking. Because, man, forgiveness has got to be taken seriously. So small issues become big problems when forgiveness is not extended. So small issues, then you bring them up later. So here's what you got to do with forgiveness. First, you got to admit it. Admit what you did. I'm sorry is not good enough. I'm sorry I broke your trust when I did this is an apology. Mm -hmm. okay. And there's times I've had to say to Mary, and it's, it, 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 this is the honest truth. I have to apologize to her more than she apologizes. But literally, I have to say, and I'm, I try to say, I'm sorry I hurt you. And there's times, I remember this one time about feelings. Oh, come on, honey. You're, you're, you're not being serious about my feelings. I'm like, I don't care about your feelings. Now, listen, here's the reality. You could say that in your head, but never say it to the person. <laughs> so true, yeah. Like, because you haven't really processed it. You're getting this, and you're like, I don't care about your feelings. Worst thing to say. Trust me, I learned the hard way. Think it, but don't speak it. And then you'll process that later and realize, no, that was stupid. I was wrong. Make sense? So first you got to admit what it is. Then you got to forgive it. The other person's got to forgive it. Hey, I hear you say you're sorry for doing this. I forgive you for hurting me. And then you move past it. Move past it. Once forgiveness is given and received, it should never yes. be brought up again. Yeah. Yeah. Ever. And if you bring it up again, you deserve what she's going to throw down. Truth. You got to move past it. You got to move past it. Notice I didn't say forget it. Because you're never going to forget the hurt. But you got to move to move past, learn to move past it. You got to keep moving forward. All right. Anything you want to say on that one? We're already behind time. No, I think that's okay. Uh, number six, you've got to enjoy intimacy. Come on. I love talking about intimacy. <laughs> I love my wife. Thank you. Intimacy is interesting because everybody perceives intimacy differently. Now for Mary, her level of intimacy is different than mine. I just want to wrestle. <laughs> There's some kids in here, so I'm just using code words. <laughs> Any brave men to say you like to wrestle? <laughs> There's a few brave men. I like to wrestle. Problem is, I want to wrestle without the romance. Oh, shut you guys up quick. Like, <laughs> There's a good book. If you have never read this book, actually, raise your hands if you read it. The Five Love Languages. How many people have read that? We okay, need to get there that for it's, it's a simple, easy read. There's basically five ways to give love and, and five receive. ways that you receive love. And um, so my husband's love language is actually words of affirmation. You would think it would be um, physical touch. That's probably his second. That's my second. But uh, <laughs> words of affirmation. Because of his upbringing, he, it's so important for him, the words that I speak to him and how I affirm him, but um, my primary love language is quality time. True. That's how I feel the most loved. When he watches a Hallmark movie with me, it's like love, love, love. I just feel it, feel it, feel it, feel it. <laughs> I literally lose brain cells watching a Hallmark movie. <laughs> but because he loves me so much, he wants to serve me. And so he's just like, yeah, babe, whatever you want. <laughs> so like, even last night, she's like, but, at yeah. 9 o'clock, I wanted to watch something else. She went, okay, I'll watch with you. I lay down on the couch. That was the first problem. Once I do this, I'm out. And <laughs> lay down on the couch. I, well, I enjoyed five minutes of the movie. <laughs> she watched the rest of it, right? Yeah. And, but it was the thought that counted. Yeah. But that's where the romance. Apparently not. That's where the romance. <laughs> that's where the romance. Yeah. Yeah. Before. For her, it's just quality yeah. time. So yeah. if we're together... Mm -hmm. You know, like, I'm getting points right now because it's quality time in front of all you guys. No, it's not. <laughs> like, literally just making the effort, and I should have tried to stay awake, but I was so exhausted. But it's like, literally making the effort should at least count for something. 
<laughs> a little? Maybe tonight. <laughs> Maybe tonight. Okay. There's another option tonight. <laughs> Anybody? I mean, Hellmark. I mean, Hallmark movies. <laughs> what? What's it? What? When calls the heart is on tonight. <laughs> I've renamed it. Please call the doctor. <laughs> I, I, you know, it, but she loves watching it. So I'm going to try tonight, okay? I'm going to try. I'll let you know next Sunday whether I knit it or not, but I'm going to try tonight. Football season's over, so we're okay. So <laughs> I'm going to try and watch When Calls the, uh, the Heart. Okay. <laughs> calls the Heart tonight. That's tonight. But yes. Intimacy yes. means into my mate. Mm -hmm. I am into my mate. I, am, I have intimacy. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Intimate. Into my mate. Mate, right? Uh, the Latin word for uh, intimacy is intimatus, which means to make known. I'm making myself known to my spouse. Everybody likes to wrestle. True. When you're married. When you're married. Now, if you, if you ain't married, you can't wrestle. <laughs> right. If you're wrestling and you're not married, that's a foul. Yeah. Bible calls that a sin, mm -hmm. right? Wrestling is for married couples. And it's okay to wrestle all the time. <laughs> Why do you say wrestle? What well, it sounds better if I say wrestle versus wrestle. And it's, it sounds a little more sexy. You want to wrestle tonight? It sounds like you're from Texas. I'm from Texas. You want to wrestle? <laughs> Some of you have a problem in your marriage. You have a problem with your spouse because you haven't wrestled enough. Come on now. Come on, man. Who would like to wrestle more? Okay, five of us. <laughs> I need to talk. You guys need to be up here. Wrestling. Romance. Romance is different for everybody. Um, I got convicted, actually, this week in Texas. One of, Dr. Leachy was speaking, and one of the things he said, and this is going to hit, I hope it hit you as hard as it hit me at this conference. Um, what you did to win her heart must be what you do to keep her heart. You know, but to rescue you, to help you feel a little bit better, I think when you're married after 18 years, you know... You don't wrestle as much. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. Oh, but. I thought that's what you were going to say. <laughs> I won't be wrestling later. I was... I was going to say, romance looks very different when you've been married I'm for 18... I'm in trouble, guys. Yes. For 18 years. It doesn't... You need to just... It I'm embarrassed. Can you see how red I am right now? I'm actually red. I feel it doesn't tingling. look like flowers anymore no. or chocolate or whatever. Take out the garbage. That's when your new you, flowers. When you wash the clothes. Oh, wash the clothes. And, and fold them. And fold them after we went doesn't away. Doesn't count if you don't fold the that clothes. That was like brownie points for you. We'll be wrestling. <laughs> yeah. Right? But right? Romance looks different after yeah, a while. Yes. Yeah. I see you in the back. And then he made We're, dinner, too. I made dinner last night, too. Yeah. I, got, I got points. <laughs> um, but I, I think part, part of intimacy, the problem is men and women think differently. Mm -hmm. And men see intimacy differently than women do. Mm -hmm. um, for Mary, it, it, it's not the physical touch. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just the time. It's like if there's a crazy week, she wants me to be home on time. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want me out all night's week. I remember... Um, we didn't share this today, but maybe this will be good for somebody. I'm a workaholic. It's true. Mm -hmm. I could work 20 hours a day, every day. I love what I do. I do. But I don't always like what I do. There are things that I don't like about my job. I don't like doing marriage counseling for a couple that's already decided to leave each other. I don't like doing funerals. It's painful. Um, but for Mary and I, where was I going with this? In the beginning of our marriage, how you worked all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I knew that one. I knew I knew. So I worked all the time. And I remember sitting, I don't know if you remember this, but I remember, it, I think we were in a couples group. Talking about, uh, this was in 74 South Grove Street, Valley okay. Street. We're talking. And I remember you having a sidebar conversation with somebody. And he said, I can't change my husband. The Holy Spirit has to change. And back in that day, Pastor Matt will tell you, I'd be out six nights a week. 
with a son and a wife at home. And I'd still be out six nights a week doing work, doing ministry. Now I'm home six nights a week. Yeah. Because I made a commitment. I'm going to be home to make sure my house is in order. Because a healthy pastor's house helps create a healthy church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so for Mary, just being home, that's mm-hmm. a love language. Mm-hmm. Having dinner together as a family. Mm-hmm. That's fulfilling family needs. Having a date night, which we're really bad at. Yeah. Like, we are. We don't get that right. I'm all, every year, I'm like, date night every And some of you guys have date nights all the time. It's great. That's because you have family around. We don't. So if anybody wants to babysit for us, <laughs> got you guys. I already put you on my mental list. All right, last. I got I it. We're over time. So we did this all three services. Thank you guys for putting up with us. But last principle, put Jesus first. Mm-hmm. We saved the best one for last. Let me tell you. Let me talk to singles for a second. Don't settle. If they ain't putting Jesus first before you're married, they ain't going to put him first after you're married. Yeah. The patterns before marriage are the same pattern that carry into marriage. Find someone that puts Jesus first. You should be dating the person on the front row of church, not the person who sits in the back nodding off half the time because mama dragged them to church. You should, be put, you should make sure that person puts Jesus first. That's the single. Marrieds, number one seed of disunity in your marriage is going to come when one of you ain't putting Jesus first. Anybody I, I talk to that's been divorced, I ask, have you ever seen any red flags? 100% of the time, yeah, I did. I just thought they'd get better. Reality is, if you see red flags in a relationship before you're married, those red flags will become checkered flags because you'll be checking out of your relationship. And so, married, put Jesus first in your life because the best thing you can give your spouse is a healthy you. Mm-hmm. Healthy spiritually, mm-hmm. healthy emotionally, healthy financially, healthy wrestling. <laughs> just want to say it one more time. <laughs> I love you, honey. And you can, and like what you were saying before, you can never change your spouse. No. You can never change your spouse. Only the Holy Spirit can do yeah. that. So stop walking about what your spouse does wrong, the only thing that you could do is change yourself and work on yourself. So put Jesus first. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says this, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. There are three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Mm-hmm. The three is you, your spouse, and Jesus. Yeah. If you have those three in a relationship, your relationship can be strong. It can last the test of time. You take Jesus out of the equation, the relationship is not as strong. That's why singles, make sure the first quality you're looking for is a Jesus-loving person. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they look good. Who cares? That only lasts so long. Trust me, everything rearranges itself. Like, (laughs) the chest goes to the drawers eventually. (laughs) I don't know what <laughs> So I think we've got to just write it, man. Number one characteristic I don't look for is someone that loves Jesus. I'm glad I found that person. Someone that puts Jesus first. In fact, I'm not the number one man in married life. Jesus is. And she's not the number one person in my life. Jesus is. Because this, what we have here, yeah. is only earthly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This will not be in heaven. No. The Bible says. That there's no marriage or given in marriage in heaven. Because you will be fully, completely satisfied when in you're Jesus in the, alone. Yeah, in the when you're in the presence of God. Yeah. So when you think about that, we have to put him first. And as I put him first, she'll feel like she's number one. Mm-hmm. Make sense? Yeah. As she puts God first, I'll feel like I'm number one in her life. So as we finish up today, we want to pray for our married. So all the married uh, couples, or if you're not with your spouse. Maybe they're not here. Would you stand to your feet right now? And all the married. Awesome. Last week we prayed for the singles, for our guests. We, we're not leaving you guys out. 
We want you to have a Christ-honoring marriage. That when people look at your marriages, they want what you have. That when your coworkers see your love for each other, they're literally like, I, I want what you, you never badmouth your spouse. You're praising your spouse all the time. You must have the best marriage on earth. Reality is no one has the best marriage on earth. What we have is the best person for us. Yeah. And then we work very hard. Marriage is hard work. <laughs> you got to work hard. And as you work hard for happiness in your marriage, and you work hard to make that other person happy, and you work hard in romance, guess what? You'll get the benefit of wrestling later. <laughs> but you got to work hard. And so married couples, don't put wrestling in front of romance. Don't put your needs in front of their needs. I need to put her needs ahead of mine. She needs to put my needs ahead of her. That's called mutual submission to one another. And as we submit to each other as married, we're going to have a marriage that someone wants to write about. Yeah. That someone says, I want what they have. I want our children to say, I want what my parents have. Mm -hmm. I want my grandbabies to say, I want what grandma and grandpa had when we mm -hmm. have those. Don't you want that for you? Yeah. That your children and generations to come say, I want to have what they have, but you'll never have it unless first Jesus is number one. Amen. So put Jesus first in everything and watch where God takes you. So I want to pray for our marriages.